Uh, Devin, do you have OBS or something where you can record locally, like just in case? I do. Want me to go ahead and do that? Yeah, just as a backup. You got it. Cool. It won't record. It won't uh, my current right. setup won't record my camera. Is that okay if it's just like my screen share and stuff? Yeah, that's fine. Again, because it's just like a backup anyway. For sure. All right, it's recording. Yeah, the workshop, I'm going to post it on my YouTube channel uh, after. Here's, here's the name. Oh, thanks for watching the interview, uh, Katerine. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I think he's a great interviewer. Uh, they're talking about the schoolism interview for <laughs> anyone who wants to look it up. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed that, Josh. I'm thinking of putting another one of those together soon. Um, I, I really enjoyed the last one. Oh, for, for uh, some people, can't hear. I think it may be that they don't have their volume up though. Yeah, I think I think it should be working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're at 5 30. Uh welcome, Devin. Thank you so much for doing this. Um part of my plan to have as many Devons as part of Underpain Academy as I can. <laughs> <laughs> my my evil plan. Um, yeah, do you want to you want to talk a little bit about your background um, and yeah, a little bit about what you'll be talking about today? Totally, yeah. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. My name is Devin L. Kurtz. Um, I am an illustrator, uh, a background painter, mainly those two things. I've done some visual development and concept art too. These days, I'm mostly an illustrator. I do a lot of illustration for books, so book covers, uh, children's books. Um, also like vinyl art and other kind of commercial illustration stuff uh, alongside I still freelance and animation from time to time. I come from the world of animation initially. I, uh, I worked as the lead background painter on the Netflix show Disenchantment for quite a few years. I loved that. Um, I really enjoyed working with that team, made amazing friends there. And I do uh, freelance and animation from time to time still. Although a lot of what I do these days is my own independent illustration work, which I think is probably what most people know me from here. Um, I do a lot of uh, fantasy illustrations, you know, all kinds of different magical, like kind of uh, semi-realism, semi-magical illustrations, lots of dragons, uh, griffins, other fantasy creatures. Um, and yeah, I would say that that makes up the majority of what I do now. Um, and I think when it comes to my work, 
probably one of my areas of strength is uh, color and light. Um, I, I, you know, from uh, what I hear from people, I know that that's what draws a lot of people into my work. I think that the way that I consider myself is that I think that I am okay at a lot of things, but I feel like I am good at color and light and I'm good at storytelling and that carries me through being okay at everything else. You know, I don't think you need to be uh, a pro at absolutely everything. And I think those are the areas that I've always naturally gravitated toward and the way that I like to tell my stories and, you know, what I like to do with my work, uh, really emphasizing color and light. So today I'm going to talk about my uh my methods for uh how i use color and light in my own work um how i have learned it talking about ways that we can you know look at reference look at life look at uh pieces by other artists and you know examine them to uh strengthen our own understanding of color and light um and then yeah just the way that i kind of translate real world information and the way that you know color and light really function reality into something that you know, is a mix between uh, reality and artistic, you know, composed work, because uh, I know I think most, most of us, our art falls somewhere in a spectrum between representing reality as exactly how it is, and then on the far end, you know, things that are totally, you know, symbolic and not uh, very representative, but uh, yeah, just going to kind of cover how I built up to where I am now and how I figure out how I want to use those tools that I've gathered to make new illustrations. Oh, uh, Devin, I think you are muted if you were talking. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's your teaching background? Because you did those awesome stories uh, about color and light. Like, yeah, where have you taught? And... Uh, yeah, I mainly have done a lot of workshops. Um, I haven't uh, taught like full time uh, in a school before, but um, I've done a lot of workshops at colleges. Uh, some, some recently, I don't know if anyone here was at my Otis workshop or uh, I did workshops at Lightbox Expo and uh, um, Ringling College of Art and Design, I think those this last year. Um, so yeah, mostly college workshops and convention workshops. And then I do a lot of online stuff as well. If anyone is uh, unfamiliar with them, I have, uh, I think like 30 now full process breakdowns saved in my Instagram story highlights. And that was... Uh, really where I got my start doing teaching stuff. It all kind of like built up around that where I, I have saved out um, many, many uh, full detailed uh, process breakdowns. And I kind of have gotten used to over time talking about my process because, you know, that's its own skill set. First, you've got to figure out how to do it and then figuring out how to describe it and relay that information is its own whole battle. <laughs> that's funny. It was the exact same for me, like posting tutorials on Twitter and Instagram stories. And it like forces you to be brief and like edit yourself and like, do I really know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Completely. There's so much that I feel like I understood intuitively, but it wasn't until I started trying to translate that in information into something that would be understandable exactly. by people with a wide range of skill and experience levels that I feel like I actually started to put real words to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, teaching really kind of transforms the way that you, you relate to your own work. Yeah, completely. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you want to go ahead with uh, all right. tell us some secrets about, about light. <laughs> Let me, all right, I think, I think that I need to share desktop one, but it's not showing me up. Okay, yeah, all right. Let me see if this works. Oh, sorry, it's making me grant access in Zoom. Oh, okay. It's making me quit and reopen Zoom. I'm sorry about this. I keep running into this, <laughs> running into this issue. That's I'll okay. be right back. I think it shouldn't be an issue for me. I'll, to... I'll just make you a co-host again when you come All right. back. One moment. So somebody in the chat said, I say that to teach, I first have to actually know what I'm doing. And yeah, that's to an extent a little bit true, but I think anybody, anybody at any level can uh, try and like articulate the things that they think about to other people. And uh, I think it's, it really kind of helps you grow when you have to put that into words. So I recommend it to, to anybody. All right, I am back. Sorry about that. 
co-host privileges. Okay, should be good. All right, I think it will let me know. All right, there we go. Sorry, I have I just got a new computer recently, and I keep running into areas where I haven't um haven't finished getting everything set up. All right, do we see my screen? We all good? Yeah, I can see. Awesome. Okay, so all right. Let me let me start over here. Well, I'll, I'll give you guys the kind of the overview of my work first. I'm going to go into this in a little bit, but uh, first I want to just kind of talk about the basics that we're going to be talking about today because um, I feel like uh, I feel like starting from like the very beginning will make sure that uh, you know people with all different experience levels are kind of on the same page about this stuff. So I'll define some of my terms that I'm going to be using today and just go over kind of like the 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 101 stuff and for anyone who who knows that we'll we'll go we'll dig into the the meat of it soon and then uh let me see is there a way to open have the chat open while i am screen sharing do you know yeah if i think on the bottom bar thing uh oh, yeah there it is awesome that way i can make sure everyone is keeping up all right cool so uh the way that we see color in the world uh, is because of light. Um, it's because of light, light rays bouncing off of the objects that we see. So when we see uh, when we see a, a, a red ball, for example, uh, what's happening is white light, which contains uh, or just light generally, which contains you know the full rainbow spectrum of colors is going towards this ball that we perceive as red, and then the red rays are bouncing back at us, right? So that's kind of like the 101, uh, you know, version of what's happening with light. And, you know, we're, we don't need to be physicists to be artists. We don't need to understand this, you know, in, in total depth. But I think that what's valuable about thinking about uh, light in this way as like light rays bouncing around, hitting things, picking up color, you know, reflecting them back is that it, it makes us consider light as this thing that's everywhere, hitting things all the time and bouncing around. Because everything that we see um, is made up of a mix of direct light and then other uh, light rays that have hit other things and bounced off of them and you know back into the air so there's all kinds of light all over all the time and it can feel really complicated but you know what i'm talking about here is so for example in this photo here we can see you know there's a br big bright noon light source shining over here this was like maybe 1 p.m so a really really bright hard light source you know coming down like this and then of course we also, when we look into the shadows, we can see light from the other major light source that we see outdoors all the time, which is the sky, you know, which creates this diffuse, cool glow that is kind of filtering down, filling out a lot of these shadows. So for example, here, these, these shadows on this white boat, I love white objects because we can see, you know, the way that uh, light is affecting them really, really clearly. I've got some more white, <laughs> some white birds down here too. Um, you know, we see this is blue, like this, this feels really blue. And that's because, you know, in the shadows, we've got all this blue light from the blue sky filtering down into these shadows. And then something really cool that we can do when, you know, we th we're thinking about light this way, thinking about what it's hitting, what it's bouncing off of, we can, uh, we can look at the bounce light as well. And we can see that even though it's like off the screen here, there's totally a red boat over here. Um, actually probably a more cool red like this, something like that, that light is hitting and then bouncing that warmth into these shadows that are facing that direction. So, you know, what we've got here is we've got this primary light source, which is the sun, you know, the first, uh, primary light source impacting this white boat here. And then the secondary light source impacting this boat is diffuse cool light from the sky. And then, you know, this third light source over here is there's some sort of red boat that this light, that light is hitting and then bouncing red light into the shadows on this boat here, right? So, you know, I, I think I got a little bit ahead of myself there, but really like, what I'm going to be thinking about, you know, going through as we talk about all this is thinking about, you know, what is the primary light source? 
And often this is the sun. Uh, when we're outside, this is pretty much always going to be the sun or the moon if it's nighttime. But then, you know, there's also plenty of situations indoors uh, where the primary light source will be a lamp or maybe it will be window light and it will still be the sun. But, you know, in, in most images, we're going to have a uh, a primary light source that is going to do the bulk of the lighting of the scene. But then there's all kinds of secondary light. And, you know, ambient light is another, uh, another way to talk about that. Um, and ambient light is, is softer. The light, the, the light rays are not as intense. Uh, they, um, you know, this is bounce light diffuse light from the sky. Um, and this is what fills in the shadows. So, you know, if we're, uh, if we have a completely pitch black dark room and we only have one light source, um, you know, shining on stuff, then we can, uh, we can, that is the best example that we can create for ourselves of what it would be like if there was no um, no ambient light. And, you know, what happens when there's no ambient light, uh, in theory, is, you know, the shadows are black, um, because the shadows, uh, you know, are whatever our primary light source isn't touching. Um, but the reason that our shadows aren't black, the reason that our shadows are colorful and are all kinds of different colors, depending on the context, is because of ambient light, because of secondary light. Uh, so th that this is going to be most of what I talk about today. This is most of what I'm looking for whenever I am, uh, you know, doing studies or working on an illustration. Um, it's really a combination between the the local colors of whatever it is that we're looking at, plus primary light source and any secondary or ambient light sources. This is kind of the equation that I'm using all the time. This is what I'm looking for when I'm doing studies. And this is what I'm designing when I am designing my illustrations. Um, does that, did that make sense to everyone? <laughs> let, me, let me just pause for a minute and make sure that we're all kind of on the same page here. I think cool. there, was a, there was a question in the chat about always using purple for shadows. I think I saw that quite a bit too. Um, I think like like you wouldn't always want to use purple. Like it depends on what the secondary light is, right? Whatever's filling in the shadow. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Here, here's actually a really great example of this. So, for example, uh, here we can see that in in this this piece here, we've got like bright direct sunlight. We can see it shining right here, coming from over here. So this whole wall is in shadow. We see that, right? Like it's this whole entire wall is in shadow here. But what we've got going on in this picture, the reason that I selected it is we've got light hitting this wall and then bouncing off of it on here. And this, this wall, even though it's in shadow, this is totally warm. Like this, I just, I dropped it. That's like yellow. Um, so the reason that I think we, uh, we go toward blues and purples like most of the time is because when we're like, when we're plain air painting outside, the big blue sky fills in our shadows so often that it, that it is a very safe um, default kind of like shadow color. And I think that that's why it is suggested to kind of beginner artists a lot of the time. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's limited to say, you know, oh, if there's warm light, then there's cool shadows because it's more complicated than that. You know, for example, and you can you can demonstrate this for yourself. If you go get a big red or orange piece of paper and put an object down on it, uh, like a white object down on it, you will see your shadows pick up that uh, that orange or red, like very brightly. So, um, yeah, I think it comes from I think it comes from plain air painting, uh, and it it's just like a limited. I would say it's like a limited understanding um, and it, I feel like it is better for us to think of things more in terms of what is the ambient or secondary light source more so than like what is the color of the shadow. It's more thinking about like what light is bouncing into the shadow and that kind of generates the color of the shadow. It's a combination of whatever the local color of the object is and then whatever light is bouncing into the shadow. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, 
Juo is, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. I knew someone who was spelled that way and it was pronounced Juo. Uh, this person says, when it's cloudy, is it still blue? Cloudy weather is such a great opportunity to go outside and paint because it, it really won't be. Like your shadows are going to be so, so different in uh, overcast lighting than they will, you know, on a really bright, sunny blue day. Yeah, this is why I like formulas don't really help because anytime the light is different and the light is always different, you kind of have to take it for what is currently happening. Uh, so yeah, I find like any kind of formula of like, if you have this light, this is the shadow. It doesn't really make sense because it's just what is the, the primary light? What is the ambient light? And uh, yeah, I find that to be much more helpful. Totally. I completely agree. Um, and the night is interesting too, because like we, we think of night as being very blue, but that's not really the case either. Like it, it really is just, uh, you know, like more muted, darker versions of whatever the colors are. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't make it blue. You know, there's all, there's all kinds of different ways that we can play with the information that's there. Um, but let me, let me go into a couple of these, you know, and just kind of continue talking about these, these basic, uh, uh, ideas, you know, so here we've got, you know, the, the, the sun light shining here, you know, this is where the sun is hitting, we can see it on this bird. And then, you know, this is a, this is a big shadow here. And we can see if I color pick that this is a cool shadow. So this cool shadow is picking up a lot of light from the cool blue sky. But then if we look at these underside underplanes here, they're very warm. So we can see that, you know, light is hitting a warm ground picking up some of that warmth and bouncing back up into the underside of these shadows softly. And this is such a, a such a, you know, an easy way to describe form and describe what, you know, what the time of day is, what the lighting situation is just from, you know, this cool blue at the top that, you know, our brain kind of immediately recognizes these type of cool, hard shadows as being, you know, under a blue sky and kind of like noon, you know, noon, 1 p.m. lighting. And then, you know, this, this warmth underneath gives us information about what the ground looks like, you know, what surface this bird is uh, walking on, even without seeing it, just because we can see from this warmth that, you know, I, we can kind of, yeah, uh, assume that there's like a warm ground under here. Um, and I, I love, uh, I love white, I love painting white birds. When I was a, a first learning about um, color and light, I, uh, I went to the zoo, the San Diego Zoo, and I took a bunch of pictures of white birds, and I, I did a bunch of paintings of white birds. And I think that they're a really, really great subject for learning about uh, refre reflected light and ambient light, just because of how much information they pick up. Um, and then also I love that there's so many different materials on birds, like the beaks have a little bit of subsurface scattering, you know, translucency, like they're not a fully opaque um, material. So you can see like here in the middle of the beak here, this is more solid. And then here, this is more translucent. Like we can actually see there's light that entered this beak and is bouncing around inside here. Uh, all different directions and then exiting, you know, somewhere else, which creates this glow from within. So I, I find birds a really, really interesting subject for learning about color and light. I have a few other examples here. Um, I think this picture, this is from Photobash, is a fun one because we can see like here in this shadow, um, this, this plane here is in shadow but there's so much light that's bouncing up into this shadow that it you know, becomes really bright and warm here um, because light, uh, we can see the difference between the shadow on this side here, which is much darker. If you look at, in my color picker here, um, this is like you know, a pretty dark shadow versus this, this is a much lighter shadow because even though we can't see it, we can tell just from the direction of the light and everything that this light is hitting this side of this windowsill really, really strongly. And that is bouncing light up into the underside of this surface here, creating this really bright, you know, really obvious gradient of color here. And then we can see that to a lesser extent here where right by this wall, you know, this wall is being hit by this powerful sunlight really, really strongly. This, this wall here, which is in shadow, the part of it that is close to this really lit wall is very warm. And then when I move over away from it, much cooler. 
So I just think these are pretty cool examples um, of the of this subject. I like this photo here. These are this is also photo bash because this whole area here is lit by ambient light from different directions. So no direct light is hitting this. We've got you know direct light coming in here and then bouncing up into here. And these planes, these planes facing this way are being hit by, you know, warm bounce light from the direct light source. And then these planes here are being hit, not super powerfully, but you can see how cool they are. Like if I zoom in here, that's so cool compared to this, you know, there's a little bit of influence of cool skylight on this side of, um, of the building of the step here. And then out here, we can see how uh, how much there's difference between these shadows, which are cool versus shadows that are warm. Got one more over here. Really just the same thing again, more of the more of the same of just, you know, oh, I you know what I like about this is you can actually see how the light that is hitting these little um, these little shapes bounces back onto the wall around them. And I'm always looking for this stuff. Like whenever I'm sitting down to do a study, I'm always looking for like, look at these warm, warm oranges in the shadows here where light is bouncing up into the underside of these surfaces versus these much cooler, uh, you know, forms facing, uh, facing sky rather than uh, bouncing, having light bounce into them. So those are kind of the examples that I collected. Uh, and Next, I will talk about how I use them in my own work. And then I, after that, I've got a little bit more lecture stuff about learning this, like how I go about learning and observing this stuff. And then we'll get into doing the critiques. That sounds good. All right, so looking at this guy here, my little my little bakery dragon, the primary light source in this piece, um, I'm, I'm sure it's obvious, but why don't you guys in the chat tell me what you think the primary light source is in this bakery dragon piece and what you think the secondary light source is. Do, do it as a little exercise. Yeah, I got some, some answers. Mm hmm yeah. Yeah, so pretty obvious. We've got a very simple setup here where the primary light source is uh, the light coming from inside the bakery. It's this really, really warm um, artificial light. So, you know, this is another example of, you know, rules, quote unquote rules, such as when you're outdoors, the primary source is the is the sun that is true a lot of the time but not all the time here the primary light source is definitely the the uh the light coming from inside the bakery and then we've got secondary cool diffuse light you know it looks like it's like evening the sun has set and there's just a little bit more light in the sky but it's coming in you know very cool uh you know it's it's early nighttime we've got a lot of cool ambient light bouncing around uh, so the, ba the back of the dragon, the forms are defined and lit by this cool light. And the front of the dragon is defined by this warm light inside. And then we've got this third, you know, phenomenon here of subsurface scattering in the wings. You know, the wings are a little bit translucent. Uh, and as the light hits them, we see through the wings a little bit and we see what's on the other side. Um, so that uh, that is the the light structure for this piece. Um, but you know, when I think about designing this piece, I'm designing it with the color and light in mind. Like this piece doesn't really have a form, doesn't really have an existence in just uh, local color, if that makes sense. From the moment that I initially conceptualize it, I'm thinking about, okay, this piece is is it's about the warmth from the bakery. So the reason that I put this first is because I, I wanted to talk about how when I'm thinking of the subjects in my paintings, you know, what is my painting about? Uh, light, the light in it is right up there. You know, that is, it's like one of the main characters in the, in the piece. 
Um, so, you know, the dragon is a main character in the piece. And the other main character in the piece is the warm light from the bakery, because that's what the painting is about. You know, he's cold, it's wet outside, and he's looking up at this warm bakery light and he wants to come inside so bad. Um, you know, so I, from the moment I, I conceptualized it, from the moment that it was a little thumbnail, um, I, uh, I was thinking about, you know, the, the light and how that was going to silhouette the dragon and um and how then I would define you know everything else that's going on in the piece you've got like this warm cool contrast which I use a lot you know even if I just zoom out you can see how often I'm using like blue and gold cyan and blue um <laughs> and I do try to bounce by uh what's it called you do try to you know push the bounds on that and branch out and do more things but uh, good God, it just works so well. Um, but then, the, you know, this leads in, uh, I think, really nicely to talking about just how much value plays into this too. So even though this is a, a, a color and light talk, and I'm, you know, kind of more talking about the color and light in my pieces than, than the value, um, value plays a huge part in, in making this work. Um, you know, value is the building block of all of my pieces. And when I go to def define, um, uh, you know, my thumbnails and uh, define, you know, what it is that I'm, I'm working on, uh, value is my first step. And then color is my second step. Um, so even if I know what the colors are going to be, I'm always first thinking about, you know, how do I want to define my silhouettes in value? And then I layer the color on top as kind of a next step. All right, we all on the same page still. <laughs> Let me make sure I didn't uh, miss anything. Um, so using light to guide the eye, we'll definitely talk about that. I've got some more example pieces here that I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, uh, someone's asking about how the secondary light source could be moonlight. Um, the clouds aren't perfectly opaque. So, you know, even when it is, you know, late and there is rain, you'll, you'll still get some uh, cool diffuse light from the sky. Um, if we could see the moon itself, would that compete with the bakery? Um, maybe, you know, I think this would be such a different image if you could see the moon that, uh, that it would be, you know, kind of a, a different piece entirely. So it, it would be a little bit hard to say that one way or the other. Um, all right. How do you keep the values consistent when adding color? Um, so I, I'm going to go into this a little bit, um, but I, uh, I, I pretty much redo, I do a, a complete value thumbnail for most of my paintings. And then after I finish the value thumbnail, I then go and do a complete color thumbnail, but I will check my values frequently, but I won't stick to them a hundred percent because you can, uh, you can balance, uh, you know, using value to separate silhouettes with using hue uh, or, or color to, to separate silhouettes. Um, so for example, if in your value thumbnail, you've got a really, really strong, uh, you know, dark silhouette on a light background, if you then add a cool and warm or, you know, any other type of hue contrast on top of that, your values don't need to be quite as strong for you to get just as strong of a silhouette read, if that makes sense, which is why I don't just like use a color blending mode on top of my value key. I go ahead and paint an entire color key for pretty much every single one of my pieces, because I like to think of, you know, each step in the process as kind of like rebuilding it from the ground and adding a new concept in to where I still want to retain the same value statement that I made initially in my value key, but I'm not um, not forgetting how much of an impact hue and color have. Um, you know, I maybe should have uh, done this earlier. I put this later in, um, actually, did I not put it in at all? Let me just define real quick. Uh, let me find some space. You know, when we're thinking about building images, I probably should have done this up front you know, we're thinking about pretty much three different sliding scales here where, let me build them real quick, <laughs> where we're thinking about things, at least, you know, for the most part, I think there's a, is there a rainbow? We'll do that. That's not a great rainbow. Pretend this is a whole rainbow here. <laughs> 
so you know we're, we're thinking about things in in uh, along three different sliders and the uh, one way to think about this really clearly while you're working is going to be switching over to hsb sliders here so we've got you know the first hsb slider hue this is the most basic you know version of what is the color so you know when you're in kindergarten where you're, when you're thinking about you know what color something is that's what we're thinking about here you know is it blue is it green is it yellow uh the next slider is saturation how saturated is your color you know is it a is it a really kind of like gray blue or is it a really fully saturated blue right and then the third is value and we can turn any image into value easily in Photoshop. I recommend, this is a personal recommendation, there's different ways, different methods will give you different values. I always prefer to fill a layer with black and set it to the color blending mode over going up to image adjustment, desaturate, because um, Photoshop processes value conversions uh, really differently depending on the method that you use. And personally, I think that a color layer filled with black is the best approximation of a real value statement. Uh, Devin, I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. <laughs> uh, I tend to use the color proof. Do you ever use that? Oh yeah, that one's that's very similar to this, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I, I like it too, because if you color pick with the color proof on, it grabs, you can grab the color. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. I should I should experiment with that. So that you can keep really it on cool. and like paint in value and you turn it off and it was using the color the whole time. That's really smart. I like that a lot. I'll need to play around with that. Um, so just before, before this gets away from me. Also, sorry if I'm a little bit scatterbrained today, guys. I've been dealing with these like crazy migraines for the last few weeks. And I feel like my brain is like just continually functioning at like 60% of, uh, of its capacity. But we're, we're getting through this. We're hitting everything. All right. Um, I am okay today. I've got migraine free right now. Thank God. Uh, so we've got, you know, these three different kind of sliders that we're thinking about where, you know, whenever we're adjusting a color, we can think about adjusting its value, adjusting its saturation and adjusting its hue. And um, what I, uh, what my process is, is to begin by whenever I'm conceptualizing an image to start in just value. So if you watch my, uh, my process breakdowns on my Instagram stories, you'll see me do, uh, you know, a complete value pass, a complete value thumbnail on almost every uh, painting that I do. The reason that I do this is because it just helps me think clearly. I, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but being able to remove all of the other information, so not thinking about edges, not thinking about, you know, really, really, you know, defining my, you know, shapes perfectly and not thinking about hue at all, just thinking about the value lets me conceptualize my image in its most basic form. But if I can, if I can create an image that reads strongly and is interesting and is effective as just a value thumbnail, I can almost surely, you know, with almost total certainty, turn it into something that is going to be effective as a full, you know, fully colored, fully painted uh, image. Um, so after I do my value thumbnail, I go all the way back to my sketch again, and I do a complete color thumbnail from the, the ground up. Um, and, you know, I started doing this a long time ago, and I totally know what you guys are talking about when you say that you find it really challenging to translate values into color information. Um, but, uh, and I don't mean this in a tough love type of way. I totally sympathize with how challenging this is. I think we need to go through that process of figuring it out anyway. You know, we need to go through that process of looking at values and learning how to pick colors that represent those values. And it takes time. It's not going to happen right away. It, it's been, it's been, you know, I've been doing this for, uh, a, you know, over a decade now, and it, it's still not always perfect, still not always easy. But we've got tools at our disposal if we work digitally. You know, we can check our values really quickly and easily, so much more easily than when we're painting traditionally. Like, guys, if you've ever, you know, you know, done a color class in oils or or gouache, it is such a challenge. You know, the teachers will have you taking pictures of stuff and desaturating it on your phone to try to <laughs> clue you into whether you're nailing it or not. But we've got so many tools at our disposal digitally here to um, 
to you know check our values to see how we're doing and to make adjustments and then to keep going and over time through that process of you know doing a value thumbnail and then translating it into a color thumbnail by doing that repeatedly you are going to improve so much like if you do that for a few years your ability to look at a value and pick a color in the hue family that you're looking for that represents that value accurately and creates that same contrast that you're looking for you're going to improve at it over time um, and I think that uh, I think that my process, the way that I've done it, has actually really strengthened that for me. You know, um, I paint my color thumbnails very direct. I'm not using blending modes for the most part when I'm painting my color thumbnails. I am literally going into my color picker, moving the sliders around or moving around in the you know in the cloud, whichever color picker I'm using. I try to go between different ones so that I feel like I had you know have the ability to pick colors using all different types of color picker uh, color sliders. So for example, the ones I use most often are uh, HSB and the and the hue cube. Um, but you know, going through this process of looking at my value thumbnails and directly picking what color I want to put where, um, going through that uh, repeatedly, um, uh, it it has really improved my eye. And over time, I've become much, much, much better at you know figuring out what uh, color I need to pick to put down to represent the value that I'm looking at. <sighs> cool. All right. Um, so here's another piece uh, here. Um, and the way that I used, uh, you know, color and value in this piece, in this arcade dragon piece, um, is different. We've still got two different light sources going on here, um, but uh, I didn't use them both uh, in the whole painting. So this whole bottom of the painting here, I defined it mainly with the light coming from inside this prize center. You know, there's a little bit of, you know, cool blue coming from these screens here that we can see it, you know, on these uh, gaming dashboards here. We can see a little bit of that. But the majority of this, uh, this part of the image is defined by, you know, this light coming from inside this prize center. The only places that we see, uh, you know, hints of the other light source are just a little bit defining the bat, the, the shadow sides of the character's forms. So we can see this blue you know, cool light coming off from this direction somewhere. And then the way that it really played into this piece was defining this dragon. So while the bottom half of this image is really powerfully defined by this primary, you know, pinkish warm light source coming from inside the prize center, this upper half is primarily defined by this really cool light source coming from uh, you know the left of the painting here and then we've got this warm uh, additional light source coming from the right half of the painting here but this dragon you know his entire form here is totally described by you know this cool light source so i guess what i want to kind of bring into the conversation here is that we can define different parts of our image via different light sources. Um, and the example that I want to bring here is actually like stage theater productions. So, um, and this was an example that uh, was given to me from, I actually can't remember which color class that I took, but we had to design a painting with theater lighting in mind. You know, uh, when, you're a, when you're a lighting director for a stage production, you have to layer out your stage, you know, from back to front and create separation between different elements. You know, you think about it, if you look, if you go online and you look up some photos of like Broadway stage productions, they have individual little lights in different colors, in different directions, in different strengths positioned all over their stage to create depth, to create, you know, this back section, they're going to hit it with a blue to set it back. Then the middle section, they're going to hit it with a red, you know, whatever, you know, it's uh, thinking like, you know, a theater director with this image being your stage, if you've got a back area, thinking exactly, you know, the same way as a stage director does, if you need to separate it from what's going on, why not shoot, uh, you know, a different colored light up into the back area? versus the the front area i think that thinking that way can be really effective um i will say that thinking that way can lead to work that looks a little more theatrical and a little less grounded in reality so you know i think that when we compare these two images even though these colors are you know technically maybe possible <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a stretch you could maybe recreate this in life definitely this looks a lot more like 
illustration heavy, you know, a little more fanciful, a little more separated from reality than this does, which feels very grounded. And I wanted to pick these two images first to kind of show how, you know, even within one body of work, one artist, like we don't always need to stick to very, very grounded light versus, uh, you know, sticking to very, very, you know, design oriented, more illustrative light. Like we can flow between them. We can try out different methods. It's always kind of a sliding scale. Like I feel like this um, kind of represents like the, the different sides of my work where some of my work is very, very grounded and, you know, feels like you could step right into it. And then, you know, other work of mine is very much more, you know, design oriented. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I think that we can, you know, we can experiment with both. Uh, would you consider the pink light in the back as third source? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I think, you know, it's been a while since I painted this. I'm pretty sure that this is just meant to be neon back here. So this is a third light source. These like reddish neon lights back here are illuminating this whole area over here as well. So, you know, it's not always like primary, secondary. Sometimes it's primary, secondary, tertiary. Don't know the next one, but you know, you, you can keep on adding, adding light sources. Um, here's another one. This is very similar to the bakery dragon, but you know, we've got the same sort of stuff. We've got, you know, this primary yellow light coming from inside the building. And then we've got this cool, you know, foggy diffuse light coming down from above. Got some more translucency in the, in, in the wing. Uh, here's another, uh, here's another one. Here's a great opportunity to talk about how material quality totally impacts this too. So, you know, we've kind of been discussing everything so far as if everything is like a matte, you know, kind of like standard surface, but then you've also got reflective surfaces and reflective surfaces operate differently than matte surfaces do. Um, and you kind of have a sliding scale from like matte surfaces on one side to like, you know, first there's matte, then there's like glossy, and then there's different levels of re reflectivity up to like a perfect mirror, which doesn't need to be just a mirror, you know, like chrome, uh, where it is just reflecting back exactly what's in the environment and really doesn't have like a local color, uh, where windows are, you know, they're semi-translucent and they are reflective. So we can use them as a way to put colors in different areas of the piece. Um, and really like, that's what it comes down to is, you know, all of this, everything that we've been talking about, understanding how it works, understanding materials, understanding light sources, it all is, you know, understanding it all comes down to then if we understand it, then we know how to harness it so that we can build you know, scenes that feel real, but still put the colors that we want where we want them. Because really what it comes down to is like, you know, maybe what I want is some green in here, you know, I don't want it to be solid red. And then, you know, after I already know, okay, I want some green in here, like maybe I want some green in here, and that's what I'm thinking of, then I need to just reverse engineer, okay, given what I know about the world, what materials or light sources can I put in there to get the green there, you know what I mean? And so putting reflective windows that are reflecting the blue from the sky, that's one solution. But there's other solutions too, like maybe, you know, if I wanted it to be a little bit stronger, I could put a neon sign. Or, you know, maybe I make a local color that, that is that object and shine, you know, a, a light directly on it, like a white light directly on it that will allow that local color to show through. You know, there's all sorts of different ways that we can solve the problem of how do we get green into this location in our composition where we want green uh, other than... Um, I don't know where I was going with that. There's all sorts of different ways to solve it. And we use, you know, all these tools that we've been talking about to get to the point where we can where we can solve that. And what's great about it is that then, you know, like as you're painting, as you're designing compositions, we can design, you know, in my color key, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just put down a color and I don't know why it's there yet, but I know that it looks good in its abstract form. And then I can reverse engineer a reason that makes sense for that color to be there, right? Um, so for example, you know, if I wanna, if I wanna create leading lines in this image down to the ducks, well, maybe there's a puddle and maybe there's some car headlights that are going to let me point directly down to where I want the viewer to look in this image. And then, you know, maybe I, I want to make sure that the eye is not going off the page too much. And I want to create another pointing line here, right? Another line pointing to the star of the show, this little girl, right? 
So I put a reflective surface there, a reflective metal surface there and have it brightly reflect skylight. Uh, you know, it's all in service of creating essentially lines pointing to, you know, our main event here in the painting, but I've reverse engineered real reasons for those lines to be there. And, and you can, you can come up with all different ones. And that's why I think it's so valuable to, you know, do the studies to figure out how the world actually works to understand the rules, because then once we understand the rules, we can use those rules to build scenes that look real and justify any composition that we come up with. You know, we can just put shapes down and colors down on the page and then figuring out how that's going to make sense in a real scene can come, uh, you know, secondarily. Um, all right. <sighs> okay, got a question here. Let me read it. Um, okay, so this question is asking me if I like using different opacities to blend uh, light sources or my, if I'm just picking opaque colors. Um, you know, I think it depends. There are times that I'll use blending modes, but as I have progressed over the years, I have moved further and further toward liking to pick the exact color that I put down in the location, uh, you know, as much as possible. That's still not always. I still use uh, blending modes pretty frequently, but you know, as I've moved into doing pretty detailed uh, color thumbnails that are that are pretty complete, um, I've found that I tend to get better edges and better mark making when I'm putting the color down as directly as possible. If that makes sense, so the more direct the application is, you know, the less that I'm playing with um, opacities and and blending modes, the more I can control the exact mark making that I'm putting down. The thing is, this is not like prescriptive. Actually, like none of what I'm talking about is prescriptive today. Like this is how I operate, you know, the way that I uh, enjoy making things. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that it's like the right way to do it or anything. It's just what kind of comes naturally toward me. Um. Uh, the artsy unicorn asks if I'm actively thinking about this while drawing or if I do it subconsciously. And I think it's a combination of the two. Um, I will say that the more I do um, process breakdowns, um, the more I think about it actively because I always kind of have it on my mind. Okay, if I was describing this, like, how would I talk about it? You know, how would I talk about this to students? Um, so I think that it's be actually become more active since I started teaching. Uh, I think it was a lot more subconscious before I started teaching and it has become a lot more active over the years. Um, uh, colors blending together, the further they get. Um, so, you, you know, that's another thing that we should talk about. There's other, uh, there's other things too, like atmospheric perspective is going on here. So, you know, I'm harnessing, you know, there's all this you know, fog and smog and particles in the air here, you know, the air is thick in the city, light is filtering through that and is creating this haze back here that I'm, you know, kind of artistically filling with this golden light. Does it need to be exactly what it would look like? Probably it would be grayer in real life, but you know, this is my painting. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a bright shiny gold if I want to. But atmosphere is really important too. You can see atmosphere going in here as well. Um, atmospheric perspective, that's another term to do some research on if you haven't come across it yet. Extremely valuable as well. Got some atmosphere going on in here. Um, all right. I, before I, uh, before we, I don't want to get too uh, caught in the mud. I want to make sure we get to some critiques here. So let me go, let me move through the study section of this to talk about learning it a little bit. And then um, we can definitely come back and, and do some more of those later. Devin, how long do you want me to, to go for just so I can kind of design the rest of this? <laughs> it's totally up to your comfort level, but I would say like uh, around two hours, uh, sure. two and a half, you know, how, how long do we go so far? <laughs> We're almost at an hour. I feel like the time just like flies by. Yeah, it just, it, then there's questions, it just kind of melts away. Uh, so yeah, like around that and however long you want to feel comfortable going over, uh, it's totally up to you. Perfect. All right. We might run long today because I feel like there's a lot that I want to cover here, but, but all right. So let's talk about how we actually get there. So, you know, I've talked about like all of the different tools that I'm using in my images, you know, how I harness them to kind of sculpt my, my pieces, you know, what I'm thinking about, but how do we actually get there? How do we, you know, build this skill set for ourselves? 
uh, we study, right? You know, like the at the end of the day, like the way that we do it is is by studying it and, and paying close, attentive, you know, taking close, attentive care with looking at the world around us. Um, and so first, I want to define studying. You can go outside and study without putting marks down on your page at all. And I actually encourage you to start walking through life with that lens on from time to time. So, uh, so not always because, you know, you don't want to be stressing out 24 seven, but if you, for example, if you walk to work in the morning, maybe, or if you walk to lunch while you're, you know, on the job and you have 15 minutes to yourself where you're just walking somewhere, look at the world around you and look at it more attentively than you ever have before. Start looking, look at where the shadows are on the ground. Look at how hard the shadows are. Are they hard edges or are they soft edges? That's gonna give you information about how hard the light source is. So if you look up at the sky and it's cloudy, you're probably gonna find that the shadows are diffuse, that you're not gonna have these hard edges. You know, the, the more diffuse the light source, you know, if it's coming through clouds, kind of that soft box effect, your shadows are gonna be soft. But if the sky is cloudless, if it's a bright blue sky, the sun's straight above, you know, it's 1 p.m., you're walking to get lunch, those shadows are going to be hard. You're going to have hard edges. And you're going to start noticing that the position of the shadows, you know, on the ground and the objects around you, that's going to change, you know, depending on the time of day as well. So, you know, if you walk somewhere at noon and then you walk backtrack the same, you know, the opposite direction at, you know, 6 p.m. when the sun is going down, take some pictures. Those shadows are going to be so different. You know, we all know about, you know, long, the shadows stretching long as the sun goes down, but really observing that in the world around you is different than knowing it theoretically. I recommend walking through life, you know, as a director. Uh, and part of the way that I do that is I take reference photos everywhere I go. I have my phone in my pocket all the time. And if I see something interesting, if I see some interesting reflections, if I see some interesting shadows, some interesting bounce light, I'm always snapping photos of that. So, you know, the things that I'm looking for, you know, what, are, what, uh, where's the sun, you know, what is the light source that I'm looking at? If it's evening, you know, how, uh, how is the light coming out of buildings? How is that impacting things? I'm looking for different materials. So, you know, go outside, look for matte materials, look for reflective materials, look for some chrome, look for some mirrors, look at the way that, uh, you know, the age, the weathering of different objects affects the, the way that, that um, you know, color and light are uh, impacted by that. And then look at, uh, look for the secondary light sources, look for, uh, uh, you know, soft diffuse light from the sky and the shadows. Uh, do the shadows look blue? Snap a photo, you know, take it into Procreate later and color pick it. Were you right? Were you wrong? Uh, start looking for bounce light, you know, especially if you see a really, really powerful color, like maybe there's like a red building. Look up at the roof. Look up at the roof in the shadows and see what color the shadows are by the red building. Um, so, you know, I, I think of this stuff as studying. I think of that as studying, you know, just walking around uh, and, and looking at the world around me and, and trying to think about, uh, you know, really actively think about how, you know, why does it look the way that it does? You know, why are the colors the way that they are? We you know what, what light sources, what, what light, what bounce light, what secondary light, what ambient light is creating those, uh, those colors. That to me, I learned so much just by doing that. And I, I really pull from it later. Like I, I, I don't have any direct examples, but you know, when I'm painting cities, I am pulling from information that I saw when I was, you know, walking around last Los Angeles last time, you know, what information I saw about what lights are on, you know, what signs are on, that sort of stuff. Um, and then, of course, the next step is to do some actual studies some do some painting studies, you know, there's no way around it, we gotta you hit the ground, we gotta do some some real studies. There's three main ways to do studies. The first is from life. This is often called plain air painting. And um, if you have the opportunity to do this, I totally recommend you go try it, especially if you have an iPad. I think iPads have really revolutionized um, plain air painting because if you're someone who doesn't have a history in traditional paint and you know that is just a hurdle that you don't feel up for jumping over, if you've got an iPad, you can bring that out with you. It will be a little bit hard to see if you've got really bright sun, but if you find yourself some shade, you shouldn't have too many issues. Um, you know, then the second type of study we can do is from photos. Um, and the third type of study is from other people's art. 
Um, and when we're studying from life and from photos, we are always uh, thinking about our own interpretation of the information that we're seeing. When we're studying from other people's art, I think that what we're studying in that context is more, uh, we're studying their interpretation of life. Um, and, you know, we usually don't have their reference material, so we, we can't say exactly, but the more we understand the rules of the world, the more that we can notice the way that other artists are playing with the rules, breaking the rules in some context, we can think about the reasons why, you know, we can think about, you know, how it's, uh, how it is helping them design their pieces. Um, but the focus that I'm going to be talking about from, you know, uh, for the rest of this little section here is more life and photos, more talking about how we can look at the world around us and uh, interpret that information into, you know, painted studies. So how do we find reference, reference photos? Uh, I think that one of the best ways is to take them ourselves. And this plays right into um, this plays right into what I was talking about earlier with like being a really active participant in, uh, in life and really looking at the world around us and trying to take in all the information. The more that we are thinking about, um, you know, taking reference photos and looking out for things that would be interesting to paint and study, the more we just will observe the world naturally, you know? Um, and then it also lets us practice composition at the same time. So every time we go to take a reference photo, we're also simultaneously practicing composing, which I think that that's fantastic. And then, you know, on top of that, we know that we're good to use it and whatever we want. Um, you know, the next, uh, the next option, if we can't take the pictures ourselves, you know, we don't have access to everything. And if we want to paint something really far away, like if we want to paint elephants and we've got no access to a zoo, then, you know, what are we going to do at that point? We've got to use uh, other people's pictures. But um, I, uh, I have two uh, sites that you should check out for royalty-free reference images, because if we're going to be using the reference material that we're using, for any type of profit, um, we want to make sure that we have the right to use it, right? Uh, and that means looking for stuff that is royalty free. Um, so Photo Bash is my favorite. They have so much stuff. I, I really love their, their reference packs. Um, and you can buy stuff one off as well. Um, here's a little study I did from these mountains uh, from Photo Bash. And then Unsplash is another great site. And there's also, um, there's all kinds of reference packs that people have uploaded to like uh, Gumroad or ArtStation. If you just search for, uh, for, reference, uh, artist reference packs, so many people have, have uploaded stuff. And then Unsplash is a huge database of royalty-free images. Um, and there's some more, uh, more options in the chat as well. Um, and was that everything that I wanted to talk about here? I think so. Oh yeah, so really just, um, I recommend using uh, royalty-free as much as you can. You know, plenty of artists do just go on Pinterest and do Pinterest studies. And I think, for the most part, it seems like this is accepted. I don't know how photographers always feel about it though. Um, and um, I think it is always gonna be safest to use reference material that, that you know is totally okay. And then also if you ever wanna do anything with it, if you ever wanna do anything with your study, you know, if you wanna put it in a book or you know, whatever, sell prints of it, whatever. If you're using your own images or royalty-free images, you know you're totally good to, to, um, to do that. So the next, uh, the next step uh, to this conversation is, you know, what are our goals for a study? And I think that there's kind of three different studies that I will uh, typically do. Um, first, we'll be color matching the reference exactly. And that's kind of like a color matching exercise. Um, so that's where, you know, without using the eyedrop tool, I will just go and try to match the reference image as closely as I can. I haven't done that kind of study for a very long time. You know, I think that this is, at least for me, that was kind of a, like a first step, um, a, like a, a first step in my process of learning to do painting studies, because we need to know how to match the color that we're seeing first before we think, can think about how we want to push the color or exaggerate the color. You know, um, the, the first step is understanding, you know, exactly how to do, uh, depict the color as it is. And um, I have a little exercise that you guys can try. Um, let me find some, I don't think I have a lot of blank space here. 
but let me hide those real quick. Let me show you a quick exercise. Um, so if you guys want to practice uh, your color selection, I recommend that you uh, that you try this exercise. Like if you find it really hard to just look at a color and match it, um, say we want to match this orange here. So the first step to do this exercise, say I'm, uh, I'm a student, would be to go and just pick what the you know what the approximation is that I think this color is you know um, so let's say the student picks this color. The next step is to go up and literally put the color right on top of what you were about to um, what you were trying to match. And the next step after that is to go over here and get your HSB sliders up and figure out okay, how can I make the color that I picked, which is wrong, it's not a perfect match, how can I make it match? Do I need to change the hue, saturation, or brightness value? Um, so here it looks like I need to first darken it a little bit. Let's try that. All right, darkening it a little bit helped. The next, I think we wanna push it towards red a little bit. That feels a little closer. I think that went a little too far though. Let's pull it back a little bit. That went too, let's find something right in the middle there. I think like that. Nope, 20, 29, other direction. Somewhere like that. There we go, getting close. And then I think we need to desaturate it a little bit. So bring that down just a tad. That's a pretty close match. Um, you know, not perfect, but I think we need to maybe go down, down a tad there. Something like that. You can see how much closer that is. So really like the point of the exercise is you, you pick a color to study. Um, like let's, uh, let's try to match this gray in here this blue gray and we put it down. Oh no, it doesn't match. Then it's a matter of going to the HSB sliders and moving them around. And this teaches us about the color to an extent greater than just trying to select it. And the reason for that is that it's forcing us to think about the color that we're trying to pick along these hue, saturation and brightness divisions, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like a two step exercise where the first step is to just go ahead and try to pick it off your heat cube. And then, and then the next step is to adjust it using the HSB sliders until we get a closer match. Um, and going through that exercise, um, I think you're gonna you know, get to the point where your initial, um, your initial pick is gonna be you know, much closer, you know, functionally the same, good enough that you could just go with it. It, it doesn't need to be exactly, exactly perfect, I don't think, you know, maybe, maybe hot take, but you know, as long as you're really close in the family, uh, that's about the point that I, that I think is good to get to. Um, so then you know, once we're to the point where we can, we can match the colors in the image easily, the next step is to push the color. And, what I mean by that is, you know, taking the color that's there and adding to it, just pushing it in one direction or another to suit our own tastes. So for example, this blue um, in the reference image is a different blue than what I used in the mountains here. But I picked this blue because I think it looks better. You know, it suits my taste. You know, if I'm painting these mountains, if I'm doing a painting of these mountains, I find it more aesthetically appealing to use a blue like I did here than the blue that actually exists in the image. And this is going to be different for each of us. You know, we each have different taste in what we think looks good, what colors we think look good next to each other. And um, the reason that I think that we need to learn to color match first is because you know if we don't have a, a, a precise idea of what the color actually is, then we'll have a harder time figuring out how we want to manipulate the color along those hue, saturation, and value you know breakdowns. You know what do I want to change? So for example, here I took this color and I moved it toward purple rather than you know this cooler blue. I added saturation to it. And I didn't change the value that much. So I really made it, I made it more purple. 
and I made it more saturated. Those were like the, those are the choices that I made about how to manipulate this color to make it more interesting in my study. And then, you know, beyond that would be making dramatic changes. So step three here would be, you know, pushing it to make something entirely new. So that's why I threw this in here. We're like, you can kind of see sort of how I got these colors from this reference image, but not really, right? Like it'd be a real stretch to say that you could find these colors anywhere in the image. But what I did was I used the rules that I know about light and the world to dramatically exaggerate the colors in this reference. So, you know, in the reference that I took, We've got warm light coming down from, from the, the sun, you know, hitting him. And I know that he is gray, but you can see some hints of warmth in here. You know what I mean? There's some hints of warmth in this fur. Then I know that his ears are semi-translucent. They have, they, they'll be impacted by subsurface scattering, which I have this down here to show you guys subsurface scattering where like, you know, thin membranes, so like ears, fingers. If you put your own hand up in front of like a light bulb, you'll see this as well, or even just hold it right up to the sun. You know, thin flesh is going to illuminate brightly um, and, and very saturated and warm. So I, I took the information that I you know, semi-translucent material, and I just you know, turned that up to 10, you know, I, I dialed that all the way up. And then, you know, and then I also took, all right, so, you know, if I've got this warm light, then, you know, what would look really nice next to it? Oh, am I glitching? Am I, am I still glitching, you guys? I got a note that I'm glitching. Okay. Uh, it, it just stuttered for a second, but I think it's good now. Cool. All right. Sweet. Um, all right. So, you know, I was thinking about like, you know, if I'm going to make this light really warm, you know, what would be interesting in this piece what would be interesting to me um, would be, you know, making these shadows cool. And we can see a little bit of, of cool, you know, reflections in these shadows, but not that much. You know, I can see a little bit in here. Not much, though. I, I you know, I, I just took the information that was there in the in what I had done. Um, and I, you know, I just turned it up, I dialed it up uh, so that I could make the piece more interesting for myself. And then I took what I know about, about bounce light and how, you know, if, if in this world, in this image, this light is hitting this really, really warm floor, that's going to bounce up onto the underside here. So, you know, even though that's not something that we really see um, in the reference very much, we see it a little bit, like you can actually see little hints of warmth here in the underside um, where it's, you know, lights hitting the floor and bouncing up. And if I, um, if I actually do this, if I actually turn the saturation up, you can, you can see a little bit of that, you know, not a lot, but you can see a little bit of it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm making assumptions about the way that the world works. And, and using that to make decisions to make an image that I find interesting. You know, that's really like what, what the end goal is for me is to make the most interesting image possible to me. You know, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to find it interesting. There's probably people who, who wouldn't, you know, who'd be put off by, by this and might not like this, you know, and that's fine. Um, but I, I like it. I think it's interesting. Um, so I'm looking for little hints that I can exaggerate in my own art. Not that I'm always doing this though, you know, like here, here is the, you know, you know, more basic version of just pushing colors a little bit. And I feel like there's, there's kind of a sliding scale in between this and this, you know, on one end we can, you know, just push the colors a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just kind of like play with them a little bit, but keep it more like grounded in reality. And then on the other end, we can kind of push them to the max and, you know, just use our reference as a basic jumping off point to then, uh, you know, make dramatic changes to. Um, and then here's just uh, some more little, little examples here. This is just, you know, another breakdown of the different types of light. Um, here's another uh, reference of, you know, just the same stuff, white, we've got a white boat, we've got cool light filtering down from the sky, we've got this red reflecting onto the side of the boat here. Um, you know, here's a, you know, different materials, just talking about how different materials, uh, you know, create different effects. 
um, specularity is, you know, important to keep in mind, you know, and cars are a great example of like, you know, they're shiny, they're reflective, but we can still totally tell what the local color is of them. I find cars really interesting to paint. I've got, I've got quite a, a few cars, not, not, I didn't pull that many here, but I paint cars pretty often. I find cars really fun to paint. I think that they're a really great study in reflective surfaces. Um, and they're actually like very, like, alien looking even though they're like the most human thing ever since we see them all the time since we're you know so car dependent at least where I'm from um but you know it's just like you know differently shaped reflective surfaces that kind of like ripple along these you know big forms they're really interesting to paint and to study um and I love putting cars in imaginative work because once you've painted a few cars like once you kind of understand the rules of the way cars work um they're so easy to use to reflect anything you want on them like i love cars because you can put them anywhere in a street make them any local color and then they reflect like so much information you know especially like if you uh if you have uh, if you're looking you know at at a car sideways and we don't see what is facing it you can put whatever is facing it, you know, in, in the, re in the reflection of it, which I always find, uh, you know, reflections interesting. Um, uh, let's see. I think, I think that was about all that I wanted to cover here. Here's another white bird, just another, this one's even more basic, but, you know, we can see in the shadows, we've got cool light coming from the sky above warmth reflecting off the ground below. I really like painting white birds. If anyone has my art book, I have like multiple white bird paintings in there because I, I love them so much. And then here's some white cat griffins that I I painted just because of how much I love uh, white painting white birds. I, I just think they are so interesting. And here we can see me using, you know, some of these uh, some of these tools, like these shadows here are, you know, reflecting cool light from the sky. Like you see how blue they look. And then these shadows are picking up all kinds of warmth, warm light from the roof beneath. Got the same thing going on here. And then uh, dark skin will pick up lots of reflective light as well. Um, so like if you, if you have like a, a, a dark skinned person outside the lighting in the sky and, uh, you know, what's going on around is going to, uh, impact the reflections on the skin and the shading on the skin a lot. Um, what else is reflective in here? Not a lot of reflective stuff in this. We got, you know, we've got some windows picking up light, got light bleeding through in here. Um, and then you know, windows, I love windows because I have already talked about this, but you know, you can do so much with them. Love painting cars because of how reflective they are. But all right, let's get into doing some, some critique stuff and we can always come back and talk about more of these uh, later. All right, let me take a, take a second and sip some water. Um, if you guys want this document, I can totally throw it up on like a Google Drive. Um, if if uh, I don't know if you want to send that out, or I can just post it on my story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think posting on your story would be cool. Yeah, for sure. All right. Okay, I am not great at using Pure Ref. I've like never used it before for real. It's so. a bit like learning how to fly a plane or something at first. <laughs> Yeah, it sure feels like it. But so some people sent in um, some uh, stuff to do some paint I over. Think, I think middle mouse is pan. Let me double check. Middle mouse. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's that'll help. <laughs> and then this moves that. OK, cool. Yeah, I, right. I think pan, zoom is mouse wheel in and out. I think I should be. There mostly. we go. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm like, I'm so old school. I still make these like huge, like reference documents for all my pieces. Like here, let me, let me open one. You have, you have three monitors now. You could, one of them could be pure up. I mean, I love it. I, I That's true. That. Yeah, I should, I, I keep hearing about it. I need to, I need to um get more into it, but I always uh, just make a big Photoshop file with all my references. Yeah. Uh, also, like there were a ton of submissions. So I went in order based on who submitted first and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we can only get to a small fraction of them, but thank you everybody for submitting. Yeah, thanks guys. All right. 
Oh yeah, just shoot questions whenever. Cause I, I don't, I mean, we can definitely do some like pure Q, Q and A at the end too, but let me see. All right, so this is an interesting, we've got a cool uh, beach scene here. Um, and uh, this person wants feedback on the colors, values and storytelling. So let me take this into Photoshop real quick. Can you, can you copy? I think copy paste something? should work. Let's see. Yeah, there All you right, go. cool. All right, so the main thing that comes to mind for me um, would be that this, this whole section here feels, um, feels a little bit flat. Like I feel like we could add some more depth to it. Um, what I think is really cool is how like dramatic of, of an angle it is and how it feels really real. Like it feels really real and visceral. I totally have like taken pictures exactly like this where I'm like holding my phone up. And I think it gives us, you know, some really interesting planes where we've got these, you know, these characters in the front that are so, uh, uh, you know, so much bigger in the scene. And then we've got these characters that are much, you know, further, further off in the background that are, you know, are much smaller, um, kind of like, you know, want to settle back in space a little bit. Um, but my instinct in, in this type of a, a, a layout is generally going to be to create a stronger value a division between the foreground and midground and background. Um, so, you know, the way that, uh, the way that you could go about doing this, there's like so many different ways that you could go about doing this. Um, and there's not like one that is like correct, but like, let me just play around a little bit and see if we can figure out something that, that looks nice. So, you know, one option would be to pretend that, you know, there's a light source further back. you know, kind of behind them. And to have them kind of like backlight, this is a very like easy and obvious solution. So I'm not saying it's like the right one, but you know, one way that we can get a, a silhouette on these guys would be, you know, doing something like this. And then we could, um, We can group the more distant figures back in space as well. But not not quite as much. So, you know, that's one, um, that's one potential way to, you know, create some more value distinction in here. Um, because my, uh, my kind of, what my brain goes to is always going to be, you know, trying to create stronger silhouettes. So, trying to create some sort of you know definition some sort of silhouette here that will define you know these guys as being um uh as being you know kind of like the main event of the piece um if that makes sense um and you know there, like i said there's lots of different ways to do this it's not necessarily that we need to you know make the the foreground dark always um but I think that that, you know, this is what my, my brain would kind of jump to here. And then, you know, the other thing that we could play with is that, you know, we've got this blue sky. Let's say we've got, you know, sun. It looks kind of like there's maybe sun coming over here. You know, so maybe that's illuminating them. But then we've got this big blue sky and we could, you know, use that to cool off our shadows and, and create a really nice kind of cool warm contrast. And, you know, get contrast between like subsurface scattering on the skin and cool shadows, uh, your cool light coming from above. And we can create some really beautiful uh, warm, cool 
contrast. Not saying that I would necessarily put the sun right there because that's the tangent with the edge, but you know, maybe it's off screen and we just see some light coming through that would imply that. Um, but you know, this is not the not the only way to uh, to create you know more separation and division. But you know, what I'm going to be talking about a lot today is kind of just that you know we can guide the eye a lot more easily if we create silhouettes. So you know, going back to my work for a minute, I am almost always thinking about how I can define my you know my foreground, midground, background in terms of creating clear value groupings and, and clear silhouettes. And to, uh, to bring, I'm always trying to bring the eye to lead the viewer's eye toward whatever my focal point is via uh, value and um, value contrast, largely value contrast. So for example, in this piece here, um, the eye goes here because you've got the really dark, dark of the hair against the really, really uh, light light of the shirt. Um, and then, you know, just to talk about like uh, grouping, you know, values a little bit, if I want characters to read really clearly, um, I'm almost always gonna make sure that they've got a clear readable silhouette. I, I think silhouettes are really, really important for um, being able to understand quickly, like what, what's happening in an image. Not that we always need to understand quickly, like. I come from an animation background where, you know, the stuff that I would paint, you know, my background paintings that I would do, they're on screen for such a short period of time that you really need to get that like instant read. Um, and, and instant read isn't always vital. Like a lot of fine art doesn't have an instant read. So, you know, instant read isn't like the end all be all, but I think that creating silhouettes that allow you to read the image um, clearly, uh, helps more often than it hurts. Um, you know, I think that making a decision to break up silhouettes and to and to not have like a really clean instant read, um, you know, to not be able to understand the image um, easily, uh, you know, via silhouettes, via value grouping, like you, I think that's a totally valid choice to make. Um, but, uh, but I think that we want to always be making that choice and not having it happen as a side effect of, um, you know, not thinking about a value structure, if that makes sense. And so I feel like, I feel like what, um, what's happening here, what we do have is this dark hair um, against this light skin. Um, this creates a really strong uh, in, uh, value read. Uh, it, it creates a strong contrast that does bring the eye here. Um, but I feel like she, uh, this character gets lost a little bit. Um, just in that, for example, like this value back here uh, creates a more powerful contrast against this flower, like this little section right here creates a more powerful contrast than, you know, what's going on in her face, if that makes sense. Um, so my, uh, what I tend to go to is to always think about, you know, if I can, let me bring, make it like that maybe, if I can bring, you know, a, a a clarity and a more, you know, strong value contrast right around, right around the main characters. And then we can push back the value contrast in the distance. And that immediately gives the, the main characters like so much more, oomph, you know, like it, it brings our attention to them so much more strongly because we have, you know, we've grouped the, that we've created different value groupings. So for example, like my uh, instinct for, for painting something like this um, and creating clarity um, would be, you know, to use like a, a range of value somewhere in, in here for the foreground, maybe even not going that light you know, something in, in there. And then, you know, obviously like a really light rim around the outside, but then grouping everything else perhaps into where the darkest that it gets is like something like this. So 
you know, grouping the values back here so that it's not using a, a totally full value scale for everything behind it. And we're just using the full, we're just harnessing the full value scale for like the characters in front. And this is kind of a cheat, but we can get away with it by the ocean really easily because of ocean spray. Like we can say, oh, there's all this like ocean spray from like, you know, waves and stuff that, uh, you know, fills the atmosphere that, um, that, that separates, uh, you know, that's creating like this, layer of separation between the, the main characters and you know, what's going on behind them. Um, so that's, that's one, that's you know, kind of how I would, uh, would approach creating clarity um, and bringing, uh, you, know, you, you talked about, um, uh, you talked about wanting storytelling to, to increase the storytelling. And I think that, um, that we understand that the story is about them you know, really immediately, especially when the eye goes to them very immediately. Um, and I will, I will tell you guys that most of uh, my paint overs today are, and just in general, are going to be maybe even pushing things too far for what you would want to do. I tend to just like really lean into, okay, like, you know, what is like a really, really clear solve that we could do for getting the values and, and color to read on an image um, really immediately. And then, you know, we can always meet in the middle. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to be a, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be like a super uh, illustration heavy design where we're, you know, grouping everything 100%. But I'm always kind of thinking about how I can use value grouping and silhouettes to create more clarity and to bring attention to what I want uh, to, to have attention in the image. flatten that, head over to pure ref, let's see the next one. All right. Okay, so this person has um, struggled with this um, and they are struggling with keeping the lighting and shadows consistent and readable. Um, and also, yeah, just struggling with like consistency and keeping things readable, it sounds like. I love the color palette here. I think these are really nice colors. Um, let me pull this into Photoshop real quick. I think this is like a really cool color palette. Um, and I can tell that you are thinking about color and light a lot, like as you're painting this, um, like I can see that you've got like bounce light, you know, on these steps here, like we can see warmth that's like bounced off the white here, like light has hit this and it's bounced up onto this step here. I can see like cool, uh, like cool tones in these shadows here. So that's really neat. Um, you know, you said you were struggling with getting things to read. And I feel like what, uh, I feel like, you know, what we need is some value clarity. Um, I think that that is what's going to help. And I don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but I have some ideas. So let me, let me throw, not color. Yes, color. There we go. So um, I've got some ideas for how we can do it. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that what's happening is that there's, there's just a lot of information. And I think that we're ending up with not very clear silhouettes on the big forms, if that makes sense. Like we've got a lot of, um, a, a lot of contrast in these kind of, you know, uh, these areas down in here. And it does lead the eye through the piece really well. I think, you know, we've got like a really clear path through the piece. Um, you know, I, this looks kind of like a, an animation background. I don't know if it's supposed to be. So I'll approach this the way that I would um, if I were, uh, you know, uh, back being a lead for a background painting team for an animated show. Cause I, I feel like this kind of has that vibe. I think that what I would do, I think the first thing that I would do is try to create separation between this se this section here, which is in the foreground and this section here, which is in the back. So the first thing that I'm going to do is grab a luminosity layer and try to set, set this back a little bit. So maybe do something like that. And then I think I'm also going to 
actually just separate this out for myself because I think it will be a little easier to do the paint over. Oh, I had this set to feathering. Oh, well, we don't actually need that because I don't want to do that again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that I think the first thing that I would do is 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 darken that because I think that immediately makes pushes our eye down into this area. Does that make sense? Like, because I, I feel like this is the part we want to focus on. Like, this is the road that we're walking down. I feel like we're not trying to focus on this bush over here. And, um, and so my instinct is to, is to darken that and then probably to cool it off too. A little bit, this whole thing, I think I would cool off a little bit. And we can, we can justify that with like all kinds of stuff. Like we can just say there's something casting a shadow on this, you know, from off screen and we can, we can justify it pretty easily. I think the next thing that I want to do is reflect some more light into the darks over here in ways that bring clarity to the piece. So for example, I think that we could have these roofs picking up more light from the sky, especially toward these edges. Like, I think we can, I think we could do something like that. You know, say, all right, the, the blue from the sky is, is coming in a little bit more strongly. And then let me grab a selective color layer. And I'll actually do something like that and then erase this out. So I just kind of, set that back a little bit and I don't want it to go all the way up. I just kind of want that to hit the roofs. So I think we can define, we can define them that way. And then I think we can define uh, the other planes with maybe a little bit more warmth. Like maybe we can create some separation on this form here and like in here by adding more warmth. You know, we can define the forms by saying, all right, you know, some of these areas are going to have warm bounce light hitting them and others are going to have like cool skylight hitting them. Yeah, I think that that's working. I think that that's how we can carve out some uh, like a little bit more form here. I don't know if we even need that much, though. I think the main thing that we needed was to separate this and that. So I think the other thing that I would do now is to just start. Like if this were if this were my piece, I would I would be you know bouncing a lot more light up in here. So a lot more warmth from whatever's going on. And we don't need to go this far, obviously. But I think that that will create some clarity. Because the main thing that I want is to get a clear read on kind of the ground and like the area that we're walking through. Let me see what that's doing. I think that's starting to bring some clarity. Yeah, let's see. I might even push that a little bit farther, to be honest. Like maybe these surfaces really like light up more. Especially because of how bright like this light is. I feel like we could really amp that up. And then I feel like this is the like main event. I feel like this area is the main event here. So my instinct is to take down what's over here and kind of guide the eye toward this. Like, I don't know if you see what I mean, but we've got this really nice shape now that's like, that's like going like this, you know what I mean? It's kind of like bringing us over here. And this is such a great like moment of contrast. I feel like that works so well, like this, really brings us over here. 
I almost want to, I almost want to amp up the color here a little bit. Maybe not, I don't know, maybe something like that, just so that it is like stronger than, than these greens here. And then I think we could separate this too. Like with something like this and create just like um like a point, a pointing. Cause I think that the way that you've designed this, it looks like you wanted this to point here, you know, cause it looks like we're looking here and this is like pointing toward it, which works really well. I think just like giving it a shadow, shadow side, like makes that happen really powerfully. And then I think these, um, I think we could fake these having glass um, in them that would just let us like tone them down a little bit just so that they aren't like taking over the contrast, you know, cause I really want the contrast to go here. We've got all these like notes on the door and I wonder if we could like ramp up like how much contrast they're creating here because it gives such a nice like gives such a nice like point of contrast you know something like that it's probably too far I just think it creates some really nice contrast there. And then I think we can maybe create a little more contrast there too. Maybe something like that. Let's see. maybe bleed out some of this red there, you know, light would reflect if we, if the sun is so bright that it's making this like white on the ground here. Um, I think that we could, you know, get away with reflecting some red off of this onto the surroundings, kind of haze it out and make it not um, it's quite so busy right here. And then let me just using selective color, I'm gonna just try Try pushing everything except this little middle section a little bit toward the cools. Uh, maybe something like that. All right, that is how I would approach creating clarity here. Um, there's lots of ways to do it though. Like, just like what I said, take every single thing I say with a grain of salt. This is so, um, this is also impacted by like my own work and what I do, the world I come from, everything. There's so many different ways we can approach, um, you know, creating clarity and, and read in any piece. But that is that's kind of what I would lean toward for, for this piece, um, for making that happen. And uh, cool. All right. Cool. I'm glad that it seems to make sense reading the chat. And OK, yes, that, that question was answered. Cool. Let me find another one. And I may not do all of what's in here. Let me see if I can find another environmental one because I feel like that is kind of my specialty. This one's cool. Yeah, let's take a look at this. This one's working like really well already. So let's see if we can push it a little bit further. Sweet. This is really nice. I love how you've used like atmospheric perspective in the background here to really push this back. I think that's working really well. Um, and I can see that you have got like a real understanding of like there's some like subsurface scattering going on in the skin and the lighting. So there's a lot to work with here. I feel like the thing that I want to do, like when I saw this, like the thing that I wanted to do the most would be bricks can reflect a lot. I wanna like, Let's see. Let me select the, the white in between and then I'm gonna invert it. Hmm. 
bricks can be really reflective. I feel like I want to like light up these bricks here. And create like a something like this. You know who does um, bricks really, really well is Angela Sung. If any of you guys know know uh, Angela's work, and Kat Sai does really cool stuff with like reflections on bricks. So I feel like that just like. It's such a small thing, but I feel like it brings so much attention to the character here. And um, and like, just, I don't know, I feel like it kind of brings it together. Like when I saw this, that was like the first thing that I wanted to do. And I feel like it creates a stronger silhouette for this character here too. I feel like I just want to like, illuminate this character a little more. I think we could bounce more warmth up in here. And I think that that would really help it feel like even more luminous. Thank you for for uh, throwing those up. Those are both the correct links. Yes, two awesome environmental artists. Yeah, I feel like we could maybe bounce. I don't know if you want to go that far. I feel like that actually made it a little less clear. Maybe something in there. And then I think we could also, like, it looks like, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of blue in the sky, but I feel like we could also reflect some blue on these bricks in here too. There's this one piece by Angela that I want to, I want to pull up actually, because I feel like it is so good and kind of applicable to what I'm talking about here. See how quickly I can find it. Can you guys see this? Let me pull it into Photoshop. This like immediately came to mind. I just love this piece. So like, I feel like we could do something like that. <laughs> you know? Something, something along those lines in here. I feel like we want, yeah, we want like a big, nice shadow here from this thing, but maybe a little lighter like that. And as for the blending mode logic, I'm not gonna be able to describe it very clearly here, to be honest. I'm just picking whatever I think will let me get to the color that I'm looking for without, you know, painting directly on top and having to be careful. Um, I've been using Photoshop since I was literally two years old. <laughs> so I, I do a lot of stuff by instinct at this point that is a little, a little bit hard for me to describe. Um, but I'm just kind of, I'm doing, some color math, some blending mode math in my head to try to figure out what will let me get to the color that I'm looking for quickly. I feel like I want to like maybe hit those a little more strongly. And then I feel like I could also illuminate these. I feel like you could illuminate the like the paper, like maybe these are catching some light and that that will help like pull the eye forward a little bit. Like it will help bring us along this line here if we just like hit these with some light, you know? like shoot shoot us down this this kind of pathway here and then I think it will also add some depth you know if we pick some of these that like kind of stick up to like add a little bit of light to and then we can illuminate these guys a little bit 
Not all of them though, just some of them. Set this back. I think that that pulls our eye forward a little bit more, which is what I'm looking for here. Yeah, it's simple, but I feel like I think you can do it. I think you could do, like I I feel like you you could do something like this. Not that you need to, but I think that this might um I think that that might, you know, bring the attention forward a little bit more here. Like the last thing that I want to do is maybe just like hit the front here and have it go just like a little bit darker, not like a ton. Just like a little bit. And then maybe push back the back section a little bit more. Just create a little bit of clearer divisions. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that really when I saw this, I just wanted to create a little bit more clarity right here. Um, I think that like as like a, a final thing to mention for the for the artist of, of this piece, um, I think that in such a busy scene like this with so much going on, um, you know, you've done a great job doing some value grouping already. I think that just doing a little bit more and like thinking about like what is, you know, in the very front here versus in the, you know, in the middle ground versus in the background, just just group pushing the value grouping just a little bit more. I think you're going to get a little bit more clarity here, um, which I feel like is is what this scene needed just a little bit. Let me do one more thing here. Like maybe if we just hit this a little bit. Yeah, I think I think I would maybe do something like that. And the reason that I'm doing this is because it feels like that's what you're going for. I don't know, I don't know for sure, but it feels like you're going for a, like, you know, a, a really atmospheric kind of glow. So that's kind of where my brain went. And as for using blending modes, or picking colors. Um, I know, you know, immensely successful digital artists who work both ways. So I don't think, I, I don't think there's really like a better or a worse. I've really moved toward picking the colors myself just because it gives me that much extra control. And that's why I do such like figured out um, color thumbnails because I like to have as many or all of the problems in the piece solved by the time I get to the actual painting, you know? I really like to, uh, you know, that's why I like to do really, really detailed uh, color thumbnails, which you can, if you guys wanna see what I'm talking about with all this, just go watch my Instagram story highlights because I've got, I've got so much of that there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that, you know, I do that so that then, you know, once I've already gone through the stage of solving all the problems, then I can just go put the colors down directly and, you know, pay really close attention to my, my mark making the brush strokes, you know, what, what exactly I want each shape to look like versus, um, you know, being at the problem solving stage of what the values and the colors. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I think I'll think I'll move on. All right. Um, 
could you consider the one below the first one next, please? Let's take a look. This one here? All right, let's take a look. Cool. Um, all right, so I don't have your reference image here, so I don't know what you're looking at exactly. So I'm just kind of doing it, um, you know, based off of, uh, based off of what I have here in front of me. Um, but the thing that, you know, comes to mind first, I feel like we want to use value grouping to bring a little more clarity to this image. Um, all right, so the artist says, I'm 18 year old. Um, Brazilian artist. My dream job is either a background designer or concept artist. And I was wondering how I could add a character to this composition. Um, okay, add a character. I would, I mean, I would put a character on the road here for sure. Like, uh, <laughs> I think that you've got a nice, uh, you know, a nice setup here where you could totally put, uh, put a character here. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think that for, you know, for, for getting the, the, the piece to, to, read um a little more clearly um my instinct would be to grab this and to group it a little bit cooler into the distance and then bring forward the stuff we've got going on here. You know, create some, some separation between the two. And um, let's see. I feel like I want to maybe hit this with a stronger shadow because it feels like the light is coming from over here and that maybe all of this would go into shadow. You know, without having your, um, your reference, it's hard for me to know, but I'm feeling like the sky might be lighter back here and I think that that might help um, help the balance of the image a little bit. Let me see if that actually did what I was hoping it would. Yeah, I feel maybe, I don't know, not 100%. That might not be the best way to solve this. Um, but I think that I think that that helps pull the 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 attention down, which is what I'm I'm going for here. And then you know we can hit we can hit some some light in here. You know maybe light catches all along here, and then these light up, of course, and then some light bounces into here. And then, you know, one thing we could do for adding a character here would be to, you know, have your character be here, you know, you could, you could really, you know, maybe you've got two characters walking along here. And it's a great opportunity for, for a silhouette because you've got, you know, dark behind them. So then if they're like, if we're imagining they're a little bit in front of the, of the frame here, you know, like walking along the road, we can imagine that the light is hitting them, like that they're in front of the shadow area and that and then we can we can kind of silhouette them, you know, like this, and 
you know, do whatever we want to bring attention to them. Something like that, you know, get, create, create clarity, create a read. Um, the other thing you could do is if we push back this even more, I don't know if this is 100% gonna work, but you could, put a character on the roof up here and put another character over here. Maybe there's a little kid pointing. Look, it's someone on the roof. Because what we're going for is, is silhouettes, you know what I mean? That's probably what I would do for putting a character in here. Oh, and you've added the reference. Excellent. Oh, okay. I see. Interesting. That's not what I expected. Okay. No, that makes sense. All right. I see. So we've got, we've got a much uh, like later in the day, like a little bit darker scene than I was anticipating. But I do, I do see a lot of warmth in here, which I think uh, is working nicely. This looks like, I can't say for sure, but it looks like there may be some, maybe some color grading on this, which uh, can make it a little bit challenging at times to work with. But let me put this up next to what we're looking at. So I think we can definitely add more warmth into, into the, um, into this over here. I think that that definitely was missing. And then we can hit this with a little more skylight. Um, you know, what's interesting is that, uh, what's interesting is that I probably would not have picked this because it lacks clarity, like picked it as a reference because it lacks clarity. Like to me, this turns into like patterns um, where like in my pieces, I always really want like more clarity in the image. Like, you know, if I'm picking a reference, um, I, I'm looking for something that has really like clearly defined, you know, like foreground, middle ground, background or value group groupings or something. But that doesn't mean that it's like a bad reference image or anything. It's just like what I naturally gravitate toward. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that 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 this is probably pretty close to what I would do to, uh, you know, to work on the image to get it uh, to read a little bit more clearly. But you know, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to go about that. Like, you know, the way that I would go about that is gonna be totally different than the way that another person would. And, you know, they, they'd be to both both equally, um, uh, you know, valid. Oh, uh, you follow the tutorial for Griffin painting for the tower. Oh yes. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I'm glad you, I'm glad that you found it useful and enjoyed it. Um, yeah, nice work. Awesome. You know, I gotta say like, you really have paid a lot of close attention to detail here, which is really awesome. Like I love how carefully and clearly you have, um, defined all of this different architecture, like rather than, you know, letting it just feel like, um, you know, ordinary, you know, like run of the mill architecture, it feels like you've paid really close attention to like the specificity of like the different window frames and the different like balconies and stuff. I feel like that, uh, you know, really uh, is really nice. And you paid a lot of like careful attention to that. Awesome. All right. Let's do another one. Let me see. Let's do one that feels like a little different. Let's do this. This is very, like very different vibes from uh, the ones that we've done. Uh, so someone is asking if it would be easier to live stream than do the process breakdowns. Unfortunately, live streaming is like a lot more time and energy intensive than like taking screenshots as I go. Um, Cause my process is like broken up like, like an hour at a time over an entire day. So that would be a lot of on and off live streaming, which is why I don't, <laughs> why I don't live stream.
Cool. So huh, let's see. So I think the thing that uh, the first thing that I wanted to do when I saw this was create like clearer silhouettes for these trees so that we could get a little bit more depth. Because like right now we've got, you know, different foreground, middle ground and background, like all like going all the way to black, where I feel like what I want to do is create like Wait, I need to turn feathering off. There we go. So grab, grab the foreground. And I just want to create like some value ranges um, for, for this. So for in the foreground, I do want it to go, you know, all the way to black. So let's, let's make that happen. Not all the, not everywhere, but like, you know, have a full value range that goes all the way to black, you know, if we, if we want it to in the foreground and then, next we have like this mid ground. And I think that what I want to do is I want to just create a more clear um, mid-ground and background. So I want to grab the blacks and, and lighten them like this. Then we can get like a clear, you know, a clear foreground and then a clear mid ground. And then let's grab our background area. And obviously you want better silhouettes <laughs> than what I'm doing. but grab our, our background and we can go even lighter like this. And it will give a lot more clarity to the scene if you see what I mean here. And then I think I probably, you know, if this were me, I would probably grab, you know, make this reflect on these stones a little bit more, like down in here, that might like lead the eye a little bit. And I don't want to lose this guy at all. But I think that will just bring even more attention over here. And one thing that's so cool about trees is that we can like point, like I don't want to point too obviously, but you know, we can kind of like be like, ah, oh, look here, look down here, you know, subtly, like you want to do it organically, but you can kind of lead the eye toward the character.
feel like I want to not have a tangent there. And then maybe there's some light that like hits on these a little bit. Like maybe there's some rocks or something that just add a little bit of like points of highlight in here. You know, it's that thing I was saying earlier where first I will just like put the color where I want it and then I'll like figure out how that could logically happen afterward. <laughs> Cause I feel like what we're going for here is like spooky, like kind of menacing. Like it feels like it's like, ooh, like what is laid out in front of me. I think we want to have this path be more clearly visible all the way through. Maybe it's reflecting like cool colors here. I don't know, something like that. I love reflective things, like anything that I can reflect light off of, big fan. And you know, we can define the foreground with cool colors. It's like a different, not like cyan, but like more like blue cools, more less less like desaturated gray cools even, something like that. That is kind of, that's like what my brain went toward. I think, you know, like, like with everything else, there's other ways to, to, um, you know, uh, work on any piece. Um, but I think that's kind of what my brain would go toward. And then hold up, I think I missed some questions. All right, so the line, this is the gradient tool. I use the gradient tool all the time. Um, Photoshop and Clip Studio both have a gradient tool, but Procreate unfortunately doesn't. I really wish they would add one. Um, and then selective color is, um, it's an adjustment layer um, in Photoshop that lets you pick like one area of colors, like grab my cyans for instance, and then you can adjust just the cyans. So here, if I wanna make the cyans like, pink that actually looks pretty cool <laughs> like toward like purple you can do that you know what I mean like do just as I am I actually like that I think that looks nice <laughs> um and then I could grab like the greens and push the greens toward and there's not really greens in here but you know whatever yellows toward like you know magenta or whatever often I'll grab neutrals and that will just grab like a huge amount of the image all at once um, so you can see how much of how much you can change the color really, really easily. Um, and I tend to only I tend to mainly use this tool in my like early on in the process because you can get um, it can look crunchy pretty quickly. Um, uh, crunchy like uh, like it can look very digital very quickly. Um, so I usually like like if I use it, I'll usually like to then like use it to like solve the problem, but then go and actually like recolor sections of my image to match whatever I just figured out, because then I feel like I have a little more control over it. And it uh, is a little less, um, I don't know, uh, digital looking, I guess. Um, but that's like a personal taste. I don't think there's anything wrong with it like looking digital looking, but you can, uh, uh, you lose your layer structure also when you use adjustment layers. So either I'll use them like right at the end or I'll use them to like solve a problem, but then I'll just, you know, grab like copy and paste my solution into another window and go through and actually like, you know, use my layer structure and like do it myself, I guess. Um, but you know, that's not the only way to way to do it. Um, I'm starting to lose my voice and we are at the, at the two hour, 10 minute mark. So I think at this point, I want to move into like last minute, like Q&A, like do, a, you know, whatever questions you guys have left, you know, cover um, whatever anyone is still curious about before I head out, do like another like 10 minutes of that, if that works. So yeah, go ahead, you guys. Uh, Tessa asks, is there anything I wish I learned earlier in my art journey? Man, um, gosh, so much. I guess um, I wish that I had started like really studying from reference more intensely earlier because I think that, you know, I grew up on DeviantArt and there was this like 
attitude for a long time that it was like more impressive to do paintings without reference. And I think that uh, that really hindered me for a long time. So I wish I had started using more reference more quickly. Um, can I show some color thumbnails? Absolutely. Like, let me, uh, one sec, let me go into one of my folders and I can show you like a color reference versus final of one of my paintings. Maybe that would be useful. Let's see. Uh, all right, let me do, I'll do this one. Um, so I have, I have this Spider-Man piece that I painted recently. Um, here's the color key that I did for it. And here's the final. So you can see how they are like, here, I'll put them next to each other. Um, like you can see that it, like, I, I really tried to solve like, all of the problems in the painting at the thumbnail stage. And then when I get to the, you know, like final painting stage, um, it's more about like, you know, what mark do I want to put down? What brush do I want to use? What's the exact shape of like this window or this sign or whatever? And I'm not, you know, trying to solve like big problems at that point. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. And I have a ton of these in my uh, Instagram story breakdowns. I've got a ton of those. All right, let's see. Um, advice on how to make drawings with more storytelling. I have a process breakdown in my Instagram highlights all about storytelling. It's like narrative and storytelling. Um, let me let me tell you what number it is. Let me go to my page real quick. Um, so that one is process 27. So if you go to my Instagram story highlights and you watch process 27 from beginning to end, it's actually three highlights because it's like 300 slides or something. It's extremely detailed and it takes you through my whole process of like building building up a story um how does copyright work in terms of fan art um i mean like they if you sell fan art online they they can, people the owners can and will uh send you a cease and desist um for sure so like that's why i never sell any fan art on my online store but as for like tweeting you know paintings or like posting them on Instagram I've never heard of copyright holders like coming after someone just for like making fan art so I, I think in general that's not gonna happen I feel like they would really be um creating a bad name for themselves if they if they did and I think that that's why they generally don't um so uh, uh, let's see um, so someone's asking if I would be interested in doing one-on-one -on -one critiques. Um, so I have made a choice that uh, that I gen I don't do any uh, like one-on-one -on -one mentorships, um, mainly because like I take them really, really seriously and I don't feel like I'm at a place in my life where it feels like that is like a good choice for me. Like my life is really chaotic and I don't have the time like regularly for doing stuff like this. So I instead like, like doing it in like a group setting, like stuff like this, like, you know, more sporadically rather than having like anything regular going on, just because that's just like not something that I can add to my schedule. And I never would want to do it in any setting where I don't feel like I can give someone like a hundred percent and like give them like the best possible advice that I could. Um, uh, someone is asking what is the correct way to start a drawing like with thumbnails or direct coloring I don't think there is a correct way like I think there's so many different ways like my friend um Zach Retz who is he was in that background painting uh round table that I put together like he, he works in like one or two layers and just like paints directly on top of his thumbnails all the way till the finish and I like you know break out my thumbnails into like three distinct stages that I you create my own files for and I would use like 200 layers so like like I feel like that's just one example of how like there's really not like a correct way to do anything it's more like what works for you I think What are the things that need to be figured out in the two value composition at the beginning of a painting? 
what questions need to be answered before I can move on to a four or five value comp? Um, you know, I think that like the, the benefit of a two value composition is that it forces you to like grapple with things like in a more complex way. Like when you add more values in, um, it's a little bit easier to separate things. So, you know, in a two value composition, like you like have to do like a little bit more mental gymnastics to figure out how, like, first of all, to figure out what you need to get to read. Like, I think that's what's so valuable about doing like really limited value studies is that it forces you to focus on just what's most important, which that's a lot of, uh, of painting just generally is figuring out what's important and how do we bring attention to it. Um, and you're know, doing a two value study like what you choose to emphasize with those two values, because you absolutely can't depict everything, like will tell you so much about what's important in the image. Um, that said, I don't do two value studies all that often for my paintings. I usually do like a, a three or four value study. Um, so I would say like to do it until you feel like it's not valuable anymore and then move forward. Um, and I will answer one more. What kind of exercises can we do to better understand value? Um, I think that like, you know, first being able to recognize value when we look at it is, is, is uh, really important. Um, so, you know, first looking at like a value photo and, you know, trying to pick the right value and then, you know, putting it right on top of the value that you just tried to pick and seeing how far off you would. And if you do that for a while, you will slowly, you know, develop an eye to where it will get pretty close. But then I think the next step is to look at a color reference, you know, a, a reference in color. And, and try to pick the value from that and, and put it down and then check your work. Um, but then also, you know, remembering, like I mentioned this earlier, that like once, you know, when color is in play, it impacts the way that we see value. So like, you know, cool and warm colors that are close in value are going to feel like they are more separate in value than they may actually be, if that makes sense. Um, so, uh, so practicing, that's why practicing like from color photos and checking your values from that can be really valuable. Um, but yeah, I think it's just something that we develop over time. Um, you know, we start by looking at reference that exists and trying to replicate it exactly. And then we, over time, push our way into trying to play with it, you know, to improve it, even you might say, or improve it for your taste. And then eventually into generating stuff out of our head, trying to use everything that we learned from the studies. All right. Um, my voice is totally dying. So thank yeah, you that's so all much. I got. Thank you so much, Devin. This is amazing. The uh, the paintovers, especially, were really, really great. It was like it was like magic. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks. Oh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed them. I'm really happy that you all came, and uh, I I hope you all had a good time. Uh, yeah, I want to show. So, if you're interested, Devin has a Gumroad with lots of awesome brushes and uh, books available. Is there anything else you wanna you wanna plug? Oh man, um, I have a I have a picture book coming out in a couple months. So if you guys have kids in your life and you like my work, then you should uh, pre-order Mother of Sharks. <laughs> well, I, I guess follow you on Instagram to get updates about that. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, Instagram. My school, Underpaint Academy, has spring classes that are just starting. Um, Adrian Bush, Jens Klassen's, uh a class on concept art and portraiture. Uh, also have. Justine Thibault uh, did a, a light and color class, and that's probably going to be returning uh, sometime soon. My class is entirely about value. Uh, somebody asked about two value compositions. We've been going over that for about eight weeks. So it's like everything that you can want to know about value. Um, <laughs> I also have a, uh, a gum road with books about light and color and value uh so yeah you can check it out and thank you again Devin for for doing this it was really amazing of course thanks for having me <laughs>